and welcome to Animal Weapons. In this episode, we look at a rather different use of a weapon, not for securing prey or for defending against a threatening predator, but for purely social reasons. Of all weapons that are used in the fight for sexual superiority, it is an animal's horns which feature most often. The weapon of speed, however, is used for another fundamental cause, securing the next meal. Creatures that use speed as a weapon, the peregrine falcon is the supreme master. Able to reach speeds of more than 150 kilometers per hour, it is the fastest creature on Earth. And these high speed records are a result of its body design. The peregrine falcon is one kilogram of solid muscle. And when making a high speed dive, it transforms itself into an aerodynamically perfect teardrop shape. And it's this ability to make a sudden and powerful attack that makes it one of the most feared hunters of the skies. This king of the air displays one of nature's most magnificent designs. It has the precision flying capability of a stealth bomber the acceleration potential of a jet fighter and its own pair of remote sensing devices, its eyes. It is a living missile. Speed and precision enable a rapid descent on its target, but not without risk. Trees are a dangerous obstacle for this high-speed hunter. An accident would be fatal. For its prey, the cover provides the only safe refuge. To increase its chances of success, the peregrine hunts in open areas, ideally farmlands where native birds have become outnumbered by introduced species like the pigeon. In fact, pigeons have become its most important prey the world over. Pigeons are not easy pickings. They too are swift on the wing. In level flight, a pigeon can outrace a peregrine. But the peregrine's competitive advantage is the use of gravity. Making a vertical ascent is energy consuming, but the peregrine has stamina as well as strength. It's from up here, a mile in the sky, that the peregrine's weapon is able to reach its full potential. With a meal in its sight, the peregrine transforms from a surveillance glider into a plummeting missile. By tucking its wings against its body, the peregrine minimizes air resistance and drops out of the sky in staggering style. At the final moment before impact, the falcon levels out and strikes talons first. So great is the impact that the peregrine too would be injured were it not for the extraordinary accuracy of its strike. Despite their formidable speed and hunting prowess, only one in every 10 attacks results in a meal. It's an energy equation that every fast moving creature must contend with, in whichever environment they live. Like all animals, predators that use speed as a weapon have a less than impeccable success rate. So to increase your chances of success, you have to combine speed with other weapons of attack.
The stonefish doesn't look fast. It is one of the least streamlined of all fish. In fact, it rarely swims at all. A sleek body has been substituted by one corrugated and encrusted with algae. Disguised as a rock in the rubble of the ocean floor, it uses camouflage as its preliminary weapon. When suitable prey is within striking distance, it puts its conserved energy into one startling burst of speed. Within one twenty-fifth of a second, its jaws lurch like a steel trap, engulfing its prey. But not every time. While not every strike is on target, the energy lost is less than that expended in a high-speed chase. are among the most diverse and crowded of all ecosystems. It's here that you find an extraordinary array of weapons, each designed to compete successfully for a common food source and for highly sought after available space. These coral reef shallows on the Great Barrier Reef are home to a killer that strikes with remarkable speed. Distantly related to the prawns and crabs, there are more than 400 species found the world over. With eyes more sophisticated than our own and with a claw modified to become a high-speed hammer, it is the remarkable stomatopod or mantis shrimp. They are exceptional hunters, with forelimbs developed into highly specialised weapons to smash or spear their victims. While this spearer may have one of the sharpest claws in the ocean, it is its relative, the smasher, which can lay claim to the fastest claw on the reef. This action has been slowed down 125 times so that it can be seen. The smasher's claws function as high-speed hammers, cracking tough crab shells, opening up a food source that would otherwise be inaccessible. They live in natural crevices within the coral, from where they can see all. Each eye contains up to 10,000 separate lenses and perceives three images. Together, they see the world from six different perspectives, allowing them to pinpoint a moving target with military precision. But without a cavity, a stomatopod has little chance of survival. And so owners fiercely defend their hideouts against intruders. Despite this fierce competition, they modify their deadly blows to be merely deterrents and not fatal to their own kind. However, for securing prey, the stomatopod's weapon is used to its full potential. The smasher quickly sizes up its target and strikes with blinding speed. In less than eight milliseconds, with a velocity of more than 1,000 centimetres per second, this creature's weapon packs a punch close to that of a small calibre bullet, making it one of the fastest movements known in the animal kingdom. It is in Africa that we find the world's most spectacular collection of animals and their weapons. The grandest, the tallest, 
and in the case of the cheetah, the fastest on land. Everything about the cheetah is designed for the high-speed chase. Its lean and supple body and its enlarged nostrils for extra air intake. And its claws, unlike all the other cats, are non-retractable and act like a sprinter's spikes when it's at high speed. It also has an additional pad on its upper forelimb and this is used to knock the prey off balance when it's on the chase. And it's these and a host of other features that enable the cheetah to lay claim to the fastest animal on land. But speed is a weapon that comes at a price. In becoming a speed specialist, the cheetah has sacrificed the weight and power of the other big cats. Here in Africa's Masai Mara, cheetah are among the most vulnerable animals on the plain. Cheetah are the lightweights of their league. They are only one third the weight of a lion and easily overwhelmed by these super predators. Lions will kill cheetah whenever possible. With speed as their only weapon of attack and defense, they almost always flee when threatened. are not even able to defend their young. This mother has concealed her cubs in a lair. But even there, they're not safe from the birds of prey. Despite these dangers, she needs to hunt. But hunting too is fraught with difficulty. At top speed, a cheetah's body temperature soars to 41 degrees Celsius. To sustain this temperature for over a minute or two would be fatal. Its valuable weapon has to be reserved for a short burst and where there is a high chance of success. Here in the open savannah, her main prey is the Thompson's gazelle the swiftest of all antelope. They are plentiful, but also wary. She must creep within 100 meters of her target if her pursuit is to be successful. It may take hours. If noticed, she pauses and makes herself as inconspicuous as possible, patiently waiting for her next meal to be within that critical range. Within three seconds, a cheetah can reach a staggering 72 kilometers per hour. But energy conservation is of prime importance, and she must know when her chase is in vain. Less than half a cheetah's pursuits end in a kill. 
Her hunting time is limited, for with the fading daylight, lions will be on the prowl. Unsuccessful, she heads back to her cubs. But a dry season grass fire is an ominous obstacle. Insects flush from the flames don't interest her, but provide a banquet for yellow-billed storks. While the inferno complements the weapons of some, for her, it spells defeat. Big cats rely on cover to ambush prey. Without it, they can't get close enough to mount a surprise attack. Unable to reach her lair, she waits until morning. The next day, marabou stalks search for burnt lizards and insects. The scorched earth reveals all. The mother returns to her lair to suckle her young, only to find it already occupied. The fire has exposed its location. She waits instinctively, hoping to find her cubs. But the limitations of her weapon have also been exposed. Without a weapon to defend suckling cubs, cheetahs lose most of them to predators especially Lion. Her instinct to reunite with her litter overrides her own sense of safety. <laughs> Unable to fight, she can only run. Only speed saves her life. The lioness knows she will lose the race, for she can only attain half the speed of a cheetah. In the battle for hunting supremacy, the cheetah's weapon breaks all land speed records. Yet it has made her cubs the ultimate victims of those whose weapons are not faster, but more powerful. Of all animal weapons, horns are among those that seem most obviously developed for attack and defense. Nowhere else on earth parades such a battalion of horns as the East African savanna. The plains echo to the clashing of horns. Most horns are permanent fixtures with a bony core and a coating of keratin, the same substance that claws, hair and hooves are made of. They are firmly attached to the skull and if snapped at the base will not regrow. But there are exceptions. Well, of all animal horns, those of the rhino are probably the most unusual. Firstly, rather than being positioned on the crown of the head, they're right on the nose. 
And secondly, they're made of compacted hair bound together, but they still function as a very effective weapon, not only for defending their young, but for fighting among themselves. Rhinos are not highly social creatures. And while a resident bull rhino will defend its rights to a particular female and to a favorite mud wallow, rhino horns are most often used in defense against predators. Especially by mothers with calves. Unlike the rhino, most horned mammals live in the safety of large herds. And surprisingly, the weapons are not used primarily against predators. Their defense is their collective alarm system of many eyes and ears, and the confusing target they present to a stalking lion. Perhaps the only herd animal that poses any real threat to such a predator is the buffalo. The grazing animals of the world have a bewildering array of horns, and perhaps none so epitomizes the horn of Africa than that of the buffalo. This is a big old male, and in the case of the males, their horns are used not only for defense against lions, but in challenging other males for the right for sexual supremacy. In fact, these battles for territory and for mating rights are the main reason why horns exist at all. Horns are put to use in a fundamental cause. They are the weapons used by males in the fight for mating rights. And at no time are they so spectacularly employed as during the breeding season. Battles like this are repeated year in and year out. Known as rutting, these rituals are prompted by a surge in hormone levels that are governed by day length. The rutting of the topi is among the most ritualized of all antelope. In serious challenges where males are evenly matched, the animals drop to their knees and horns interlock. They will wipe their faces on the ground or pour repeatedly to disperse scent from glands both below their eyes and under their feet. The contest ends as suddenly as it began, but will be performed throughout the season until a victor is decided. Topi live in mixed female and male herds where both sexes bear horns. In Impala, it is only the male which bears horns and maintains an established territory. He must wait for migrating females to pass through his patch. These adult females are in estrus and the male tests their reproductive readiness. He mates with those that are responsive. He is the dominant male and spends at least 25% of his time rounding up and mating with females. Not only does he need to keep females within his territory, he must also keep other males out leaving him little time to rest or feed. Even recently weaned males are seen off, sometimes in a spectacular fashion, which displays the victor's strength and virility. Well, giraffes too have horns, and even though they're the only animal which is actually born with horns, their horns are more for decoration than for attack and defense. 
because when it comes to fighting, giraffes really use their heads. While the horns of the giraffe are reduced and not a prominent weapon, their long muscular necks are an effective substitute. Their neck and head performs as a massive mallet. But blows seldom land solidly. These young males do their best to avoid being hit by the other. The force of a solid blow is staggering. Yet this gracefully ritualized display of aggression rarely results in serious injury. The heavier the skull and the wider the arc of the swing, the harder a giraffe can hit. Hence the advantage of size, height and weight, the key factors that will determine which male wins dominance and the right to mate with the females. The giraffe and antelope live among some of the most efficient predators on the planet. Yet their weapons are not designed entirely for their own protection or to secure their own food. It is the individual's contest to continue his lineage that determines the size, shape and function of his weaponry. Rainforests are among the most diverse of all the world's ecosystems. While the African plains are the arena of challenge for the world's grandest creatures, these Australian tropical forests are the battlegrounds of the mini beasts. Here in the lush undergrowth, bizarre creatures engage in power struggles. For most of the year, they live solitary and relatively uneventful lives. But this is the mating season, a time to challenge and conquer. They gather together in suits of shining armor and with weapons of oversized proportions. The victors will claim the ultimate prize mating rights to their miniature maidens. Male stag beetles are armed with horn-like projections, which are actually extensions of their mouth parts. Females are smaller and without horns. The presiding male has raised his antlers as a show of strength to the invading male. Their weapons are used as levers to flip their opponents off balance. Those toppled to the ground are out of the contest, but will live to fight another season. The victor takes possession of his prize. Others, like the rhino beetle, have only one season to prove themselves. Well, like all insects, the rhinoceros beetle develops through different life stages until it becomes a fully formed adult. In fact, it spends more of its life like this as a grub than it does like this as an adult. As a grub, it feeds on rotting logs and leaf litter, and it's the availability of this food source which determines how big its body and horns will be when it emerges as an adult. When food is plentiful, their larval development is extended, resulting in larger horn and body size. Victory will be governed by their fortunes as a grub.
In most cases, large horns are the key to success. They are able to lift 850 times their own weight. Victor must contend with his persistent competitors. Even as his paternity hangs in the balance. While the rhino beetles fight it out among themselves, another horned insect waits in hiding for a particular tree to fall before its battles can begin. A white mahogany tree falls and begins its process of decay. It exudes an odour that acts like a magnet for a rare and elusive little insect. For the antlered fly, it signals a potential egg-laying site for the female of their species. Rarely seen, antlered flies are a highly unusual group of insects. Distinct from other flies, the males bear greatly oversized antlers. They are actually extensions of their exoskeleton. Males come from all over the forest to make a claim on a suitable egg-laying site. They don't engage in brutal battles. Their power struggles involve subtle body and wing gestures as well as some pushing and shoving. A male that is clearly inferior in size simply makes an appearance and flies off without a challenge. This is known as an intrusion. More evenly matched males linger, flick their wings and sway their bodies. If two males are evenly matched, their posturing culminates in the interlocking of horns and head-on combat. They push against each other, their antlers interlocked, and rise up on the tips of their middle and hind legs. This usually only lasts for a few seconds before one of the males is overpowered and retreats. They may engage in a few of these battles before a winner is decided. Battles become complicated by the arrival of a female. Her foremost concern is finding a suitable location to lay her eggs, usually the exact site that the male is guarding. She may have already mated, but this doesn't stop the presiding male from mating with her again. But even while the pair are mating, other males make challenges. Even after they've mated, the male stays astride the female, ensuring no other males have access. She inserts her ovipositor beneath the bark and lays her egg clutch. While she lays, the presiding male continues his guard. For the antlered fly, the size of his antlers are his passport to paternity. This is the eastern escarpment of Israel's Judean desert. 
the lowest point on land. And like any desert, it appears lifeless, but looks can be deceiving. For this is one of the favorite haunts of a wild species of goat known as the ibex. And if you happen to be here at the right time of year and the right time of day, you may be lucky enough to witness one of the spectacular displays of male rivalry. These battles are among the most vigorous of any horned mammal. The force of a full horn impact is equal to four tons of pressure. These old males are over six years of age and have the largest horns of the herd. Facing backwards, their horns are clearly not used against predators. Their defence is their extraordinary agility. When threatened, they can escape into rugged and inaccessible terrain. Their sponge-like hooves are able to grip rocks, where a single slip could mean death or severe injury. To fully appreciate how the ibex uses its horns as a weapon is to understand its breeding cycle. For most of the year, males live separately from females. Towards the end of autumn, the herds merge in preparation for mating. A well-defined hierarchy exists within the male group. Those who dominate are large-bodied and boast large horns. They're weapons in the violent battles that precede mating. For ibex, large horns and exclusive mating rights can only be attained with old age. But this doesn't deter the younger males from trying to win over females. With necks lowered and tongues outstretched, they test the reproductive readiness of the females by tasting airborne hormonal levels. Females prefer to mate with old males and will ignore the approaches of those that are unsuitable. But the young males continue regardless. While ibex horns grow throughout life, they slow their growth on maturity and stop growing altogether in the breeding season. This may be because males expend a lot of energy and eat little, or perhaps it's a result of changing hormonal levels. These females may have already mated and show increasingly less interest. By the end of the rut, the males regroup and recover from the exhausting six-week rutting and mating period. Yet throughout their lives, males continue to jostle. They will often gather together in a huddle to size up their opponent's horn size. While the old males need only to maintain their status, the young must establish a place in their upwardly mobile peer group. Young males engage in the most violent battles. They rear up to increase the impact of their assault. Ibex horns are designed in such a way that they both inflict offensive blows 
and deflect the blows of opponents. On contact, they twist their head slightly to lessen the impact, which is taken on the strongest lower part of the horn. The bony ridges prevent the horns from slipping past each other and causing accidental injury. Some battles do result in broken horns and wounds. But the greatest damage is that caused to the male's social status. Denial of the right to mate with females. While old males engage in fighting more often, it is more ritualised and less energetic. They have the advantage of experience and use their weapons sparingly. Ironically, once old males reach their sexual zenith, they become the most vulnerable. Their heavy bodies and greatly oversized horns reduce their agility. This not only increases their chances of serious injury on the slopes, but also makes them prime targets for predators. They're forced to move with less speed and greater caution. While the success of their weapon now jeopardises their own survival, they have ensured the proliferation of their own offspring. A dominant male's reign may only last a few seasons before one of his subordinates succeeds in taking the top position. Such is the price of a weapon that serves only a social function. Speed is used primarily for securing prey, horns play a completely different role in an animal's life, but one that is equally important. They are the weapons used between males to joust and butt, clash and posture. While the fights are sometimes violent, they are ritualised and more about mating than maiming. They are a form of contact body language that determines who mates with who. The larger horned victors pass on their genes at the expense of males less well endowed. It is this genetic selection that ensures that horns continue to be used as vital weapons in social battles by creatures large and small from all over the planet. Well, that's all for this episode of Animal Weapons. Goodbye for now.